the Rhode Island Foundation, partnering with passionate Rhode Islanders to lead, transform, and inspire our state. Learn more at RhodeIslandFoundation.org. Welcome to another segment of In Another Opinion, a public information program where our discussions are focused on the communities of color in the state of Rhode Island. I'm your host, Peter Wells. Today's guests are Carla E. Vigil, co-founder and chief connector, and Carlin Howard, co-founder of Edu Leaders of Color of Rhode Island. Welcome, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks for, for appearing on the show today. We're talking about education. Education is probably one of the, the more uh, uh, lucent issues right now in the country. Making sure that we're paying our teachers well enough, that uh, our students are being taught with the tools that they'll need for the 21st century and further. So tell me what Edu Leaders of Color of Rhode Island is, what it's about, and, and what you do. Sure. Either way. Um, <clears throat> So we are an initiative that's focused specifically on empowering and elevating the voices of educators of color, um, also leaders of color. Uh, we're working to create space or more so an ecosystem in Rhode Island that supports teachers of color, uh, where they could feel empowered, where they can share practices, where they could talk about issues on um, equity in education, um, also work as thought partners to think of solutions to tackle inequities that exist um, within our um, education system in Rhode Island. This year we're also focusing on facilitating seminars that, um, that are centered around race discussions, anti-bias work, um, and other equity related um, issues, we feel that it is important that teachers are teaching our students um, with, a, with a consciousness of, of themselves and their own identity in order to really uh, cultivate really deep relationships with their, with their students. We're also looking at um, research and, and designing an alternative teacher prep program. So we're thinking about, uh, well, how do we increase the amount of teachers of color in our classrooms. Um, we know that this is, um, in, in Rhode Island, there are about 5% of teachers of color throughout the whole state. In Providence, it's about 23, approximately 23%. Mm -hmm. um, and our student population in Providence, about 90% students of color. Uh, so this is a big, there's a big disproportionate percentage there. And uh, we know that this is not just an, an issue of Rhode Island. It's a national issue. Right. So we are collaborating with other leaders across the country to think of innovative solutions on how to tackle this, this uh, problem that we're facing. So, so how, how, did, uh, how did you come up with this Edu Leaders of Color? Where, mm -hmm. where did it come from? Right, so um, a couple years ago, wow, it's crazy to even think it's been that long, about a year and a half really, we were at an event called Startup Week in Education. Um, and during this event, we had a bunch of different people come together and the idea was to create and come up with a bunch of ideas to solve pressing problems in education. Um, and particularly the theme of the event was culturally responsive content. So this idea that how could we use design thinking processes to come up with solutions to address culture responsive content? Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of great ideas that came out of it and some of them even have gone off to do great things um, in our community, including one that one of our friends started called Diversity Talks. Um, but after that weekend, we felt inspired and there were a lot of people who were just really interested in investing in these type of issues. So what we ultimately did was come together um, and start to brainstorm ways that we could continue the momentum, right? And that's how we kind of came up with Edu Leaders of Color Rhode Island. It originally just started out as us inviting a bunch of people that we knew who identified as people of color or either allies who are working within the work um, in education and thinking about this ideal of uh, teacher of color retention, teacher of color recruitment, and bringing us all together just to brainstorm. Mm -hmm. And then from there, people really like just being in the environment, right? Not even necessarily just discussing the ideas, but just literally being in the environment because they felt um, that they had a support group almost, if you will. Um, so each month, we just kept repeating and, and doing the same thing and delivering. And eventually, we started bringing in people to talk about their community initiatives and things they're working on, and it mm -hmm. just kept building from there. Now, both of you are teachers, formally. Mm-hmm. 
or still. Yeah. In theory. We're parents. Yeah. Parents are teachers. <laughs> okay, that's true. <laughs> so, so, what what drove the initiative? Uh, Edu Colors. What drove it? Um, um, you know, I know you said that it was a, an environment for people to come in and share ideas and resources. But what, what drove that? Was it you as a parent or you as a teacher? Right. I think I think that's a good a good question. So for us, we actually met in an environment where we were trying to figure out how can we make education better for kids. I think for both of us, we were pretty stressed with the environments that we were in. Um, Is that Rhode Island environment? Yeah. Within a, yeah, Rhode Island environment, working <laughs> within yes. a, yeah, exactly, working within a public uh, school and trying to figure out how do we bring kids' cultural identities into the classroom? Uh, because we felt, and you know, mm -hmm. this is just our personal opinion, that a lot of schools were not incorporating that into the curriculum, they weren't incorporating that into the instruction. So we have a bunch of students who are telling, hey, go out do well academically, but then we're completely divorcing them from who they are and their identities and we're not talking about those things. Now you have on like some one-off situations or whether you, or you might have some teachers who are doing those things, mm -hmm. but systematically and within a whole school or within a district, it wasn't happening. And for us, we found that very stressful because the focus was more on how do we get kids prepared for standardized testing? How do we get kids prepared um, for, for assessments? Which we know, right, that is gonna be how they access a lot of colleges and SATs mm -hmm. and all these other things, which is, we understand that. But we also know that kids have to be functioning human beings in the world. And we were concerned that a lot of classrooms, a lot of schools, a lot of districts weren't focusing on this piece of kids need to be functioning human beings. Sure. And they can't do that if they don't really truly understand who they are and know how to bring themselves into the work that they're doing as a student. Now, I was looking at your website um, earlier, and I noticed you used the, ter the term an equitable classroom. What do you mean by an equitable classroom? Yeah, so I think that um, now equity is being loosely used in okay. many different spaces, right? Mm -hmm. when, when we think of equitable classrooms, we're thinking about um, everything from like language to access to materials, to what the content looks like, um, to um, the responsiveness of students' identities, um, to embracing and empowering um, students' um, identity as well. So, so equity is is really about uh, making sure that you're providing all the access to all all different kinds of resources and resources that that you're able to provide as a teacher perhaps but maybe also resources that they if they can, you can't provide it in the classrooms helping them understand how they may be able to access those resources outside of the classroom now you're connected you're still the senior associate with uh, the Center for Collaborative Ed Education yes do you bring those resources to this project um, I think yes, and I think vice, vice versa. Okay. I think a lot of the framework, so I've, I've currently um, have created a framework based on James Banks' dimensions. Um, what, what is James Banks? James Banks is, he's seen as the godfather of multicultural education. Okay. Right? So he has these five dimensions that he believes in, um, content, um, knowledge, knowledge construction, content integration, prejudice reduction, uh, empowering and empowering a school culture. Now, all these dimensions really work together in order to create an effective, equitable classroom. So, based on his studies and his um, his work, uh, I've created a framework that teachers can use in order to hold themselves accountable to make sure that they're equitable in the, in the classroom. Right. So, who's being represented in in, in my in my um, lesson? Who's not? Whose voice is there? Who has the power? How am I? How are my students really investigating um, their sources? Right? How are, how are students being empowered by what they see in the content? How am I differentiating according to my my the needs of my learners? Mm -hmm. uh, so this I received my master's through the Gordon School. That's in East Providence, right. and they're really focused on racial diversity and multicultural education. Mm -hmm. And so I did a one-year residency there, and um, it was in collaboration with Roger Williams University. And I taught there for a year, and the the access and the 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 teaching strategies that I use there are amazing. Mm -hmm. You have uh, students that are really thinking critically, that are questioning adults, that feel safe, um, the small classroom sizes, but more importantly, I think it's a teaching strategy. So when I was there for a year, I was like, why 
can we do this in public schools, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, at the end of the day, like yes, they have a beautiful campus. It's a, definitely a privileged environment, sure. but it's about spreading the teaching practices, right? It's about what questions you ask your, ask your students. It's about how you treat your students. It's about the lens that you see your students in, right? So first is about knowing yourself. So all these kind of reflective moments and um, strategies, I felt like could definitely be implemented in public schools as well because it's the leader, right, that's at the head of the classroom. So how was that received in the public schools? So in the, so I taught at a charter school right after that. So I was able to, my, my teaching um, uh, year in getting my master's, we uh, studied systems, right? The history of education. Mm -hmm. Who was education made for? Mm -hmm. What happened throughout the past 100 years? So I really understood it in a really systematic kind of way. So I saw how it worked in this really private, privileged setting. And then I saw how it worked in a charter school. Where, where, um, where it was mostly kids of color and uh, which, we, you know, in my opinion, the school was really giving the kids more, more hours in the which, day. Which charter school were you at? Uh, it, Blackstone okay. at Valley Prep, okay. um, which was great in many ways, but in, in, I saw the, the inequities that still existed there. Uh, so was it... Was that happening in, in in at that school? Not entirely. Right. Was I um, applying my practice now in that in the classroom? Yes, it was received great. However, I feel like the the I wasn't. If you okay. understand what I'm saying, sure. uh, my 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 own identity was not something that was embraced in 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 that culture. And I would imagine that since uh, the school departments in Rhode Island are, have all uh, followed the the, the federal curriculum, it, it might be very difficult anyway, we, even within a charter school, although right, charter schools right. have, have some uh, some, exactly. limits, uh, mm -hmm. some availability to be more flexible. Yeah. Now, I think you make a good point there because the trick about public schools is that it is public, right? That's, right? that's the beauty and the challenge of it, right? Mm -hmm. So on one end, we know that public schools are held accountable to the public, right? We pay public tax dollars to fund schools. but. That also means that a lot of different people come to the table with different thoughts and opinions on what is the right way to educate kids, mm -hmm. right? So some people feel like it should be strictly academic, you know, there shouldn't be any uh, a focus on identity development or culturally responsive teaching as the term is. Um, or they may feel like on the flip side, it should be all of that, right? So oftentimes, when you're thinking about these issues, we're approaching it from a more systematic level, right? Because we're not just trying to say, hey, we need to do this in the classrooms. We're trying to talk to, to tell policymakers, hey, this matters. The research has proven that it matters. We're trying to tell administrators, this matters. The research has proven that this matters. But we do know that at the end of the day, there's just a lot of different thoughts and opinions on what is the appropriate, what is the right way to actually educate kids. Um, so it's a lot of different forces at work and at play when you're thinking about how do you actually integrate these issues into the, into the classroom setting. Mm -hmm. Now your website and Carly they mentioned it earlier and I think you did as well that there are, there are other leaders besides teachers what other uh, disciplines are involved in edu yeah. leaders of color? Yeah. Oh yeah so I, I mean we have a lot of um, folks that work for ed in educational spaces so organizations so people from um, we have from the neighborhood revitalization um, initiative, right? We know that housing intersects with education um, in many ways, and that's a whole nother discussion, but we have um, people from the innovation um, department at RIDE. Uh, we have folks from RIDE coming in. We have pol political figures, so Nera, um, uh, I don't want to mess up her last name, La Fortune? Yes. From City Council. City Councilwoman. She, she attends our meetups. Um, am I forgetting? Some folks. You even uh, had a you had a meeting with Gina Raimondo too. I noticed. Gina yeah. came to our our meetup. Yep, the yeah. mayor came mm -hmm. to our last meetup. We had uh, Chris Emden, who is the author of um, "For White Folks That Teach in the Hood" and the rest of y'all too. And he was there, and he brought um, actor Derek Luke with him as well to talk about education and the, also the power of community. Uh, How did you make that connection to him? So we have mutual friends. Okay. Uh, Carlos Moreno, who works, um, he's the um, director of Big Picture Learning, co-director okay. of Big Picture Learning. And just to add to, you know, the, the big thing that we're trying to approach is that we understand that 
it's going to take more than just people who work in education to actually transform a right. system, right? It's going to take people who work mm -hmm. in policy. It's going to take mm -hmm. people who work on the legal side of things. Absolutely. It's going to take people in business. It's right. going to take people um, who work uh, in sectors across the board. Exactly. Um, because oftentimes what happens in education is that we work in silos. Mm -hmm. Everything that happens in education is almost like we we act as if we're separated from the rest of the world, but mm -hmm. in actuality, education and schools are probably the one thing where the vast majority of the population experiences, right? That is the one thing that sure. we, most of us probably have in common is some sort of experience with schooling. Mm -hmm. um, so we do need all these different players, all these different actors intersecting in order to think about a bigger and better approach to changing the system because it just can't be done just with educators alone. Now, how do you find time, Carlin, since you're the executive director of Breakthrough Providence? When do you find time to do this? Well, that's, yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, so my daytime job is working with Breakthrough Providence. Uh, and Breakthrough Providence focuses on expanding college access for students from underserved communities while also trying to encourage talent high school and college students to consider careers in education. They're very complimentary. So everything I do is very complimentary of each other. So during my daytime job, I'm working with younger um, individuals to get them involved in some of the work that we're doing now on the more, uh, I guess, adult level work mm -hmm. and getting them into that, kind of that atmosphere. So as far as time, man, you know, what I end up doing is the daytime is pretty much focused on uh, Breakthrough Providence and then the nighttime, the weekends is when our, our meetups happen, that's when our planning happens, that's when our work happens. Uh, so it, it does require a level of focus mm -hmm. that at times can be challenging, but also, it feel, it's fulfilling. So I, I feel like I am serving a bigger purpose than myself. So, and I feel like I'm in a position where not many people who look like me often um, are absent from these type of conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like it's almost a duty, uh, my responsibility, uh, to give back to the community in these different ways because oftentimes um, my, the perspective of people who look like me, and I don't like to talk for everybody who looks like me, but that perspective is often um, separated from the conversations. Now, as your leaders started in what, 2016, 2017? 2017, yeah, well, at first, our first like Six, meeting yeah. was November 2016. Okay. Yeah. So, so my question then, as far as the metrics, how will you know that you're making a difference? Yeah, so that's what we're starting to do this year now that we got funding. So first it was pretty much um, uh, by just seeing the response of, of folks coming into our space. Like mm -hmm. every month there was new people. Our community was growing and growing and growing and people were just telling us, uh, we need this, this is great, right? Um, so once we um, got funding, which started this year in January, now we're starting to collect just data by survey um, to see who's in the room, who are teachers, when did they start teaching? And then we're gonna do um, a collection of data at the end of the year to see if the teachers are still teaching and also what, what purpose um, the space served. Uh, and, and so, and we're also doing more research on how we can collect more data in the next coming years and what our strategic plan will look like for the next two to three years. Mm -hmm. So that's what, it's like a lot of planning this year. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that the implementation of, of some of, of our other work will come in the in the next two years. And, and just to add to that too, you know, one of the things that we noticed um, as we were doing these meetups is that uh, oftentimes people are coming to us telling, oh, we made this great connection with yeah. this person. Mm -hmm. If it had not been for this event, we sure. would have never known about this. Well, people have gotten hired. Mm -hmm. um, they well, networking concept. Right, exactly. 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 So that's right. what, that's what and it, it, it serves. It, we're also, what, what we realize is that we're trying to also build social capital. Right, so when we talk about supporting our leaders and teachers of color, we're also talking about, look, how do we get into those spaces of leadership roles where we're also thinking from this equity mindset and lens so that we're hiring the right people and to put them in the right spaces, right? So mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things that we're pushing is making sure that we're at the table when it comes to decisions around education reform, education, anything, because we, we have ideas. We're hearing it from the people. Mm -hmm. We we're, we were teachers, and so it's coming from this like really authentic um, um, place. Well, how, so so how do you see that developing as a as a member of the commission, that by uh, by virtue of being appointed, or as a contractor working with the commission? 
I think just by having a conversation. So I think like one, we, I mean, we've had people from Ride come to our meetup. So they've invited, I mean, I have a meeting at the end of the month to talk about this, th their new certification process. And I think it's just about having a meeting and talking about how could we work as thought partners and as collaborators in this, making sure that you're working with the community and just not for the community, right? Let me, now let me get this, uh, right now you're focused on Providence or statewide? Statewide, we're starting in Providence. Um, we feel like that's the most um, uh, need area, uh, but we we think it's just as important to be doing this work in East Greenwich, Cranston, uh, you know, Central Falls also, um, and all other other districts as well. But we want to start in Providence. So, where does inter interested people go? To find out about your program, to find besides the website, uh, uh, to find out when you're having meetups, uh, which is an interesting term, um, in, in itself. Uh, I was trying to visualize a meetup, but, but you should uh, come. Well, I, I might very well do that. September and, uh, is the next one. Yeah, you know, I was thinking of a bunch of Harley Davids uh, people on bikes <laughs> pulling up for a meetup, but but, but uh, yeah. So how do people find out about this? Yeah, so I think the one of the biggest ways people find out about us is actually Twitter. through social media, uh, Facebook, okay. uh, Twitter. If you look up Edu Leaders of Color Rhode Island, you can find us on both those platforms. Also, word of mouth, people. Um, uh, reaching out to other people, sending emails, inviting other people. Uh, we, in most cases, almost 50% of the people who attend are brand new to the mm -hmm. like first time attendees. Um, are you finding repeats? Are they coming back? Oh yeah, back? definitely. We, repeats, but we always get like new folks in the room, which yeah. is great. Mm -hmm. It's telling us that you know new people are hearing about this, um, but we definitely get people that have been consistently coming to the meetups. Yeah. And so, how many meetups have you had thus far? This year. Yes. Or well, let's all say, throughout. Well, uh, since, since 2017, apparently, because I saw on your website, uh, that's where uh, I noticed some has, were posted. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, probably like, like 10. Six, awesome. And like where do you now? have them? So that's a good question because we're very intentional about having our meetups in different spaces all throughout Providence. So we switch it up every month. Um, we've had it at, um, we just had the last uh, two at the Water Fire Arts Center, which is whole, is. Right holding the um, Rosa, Rosa Parks, Parks house. Exhibit, so it's yeah. been pretty powerful to have it there because uh, Barnaby has been um, generous enough to open, we have it in this visitor room and he's opened up the gate. So our folks go and kind of get to see it. And he's also, there's also a lot of interesting work um, happening coming out of um, that exhibit and, um, and the water fire um, center. So uh, we're, we're gonna be working together in the next few months to bring people and also think about how do we reach uh, teachers and bring students to the space. Uh, and also, I grew up, I mean, I, mean my, I lived in that area for a long time, so I've mm -hmm. seen the warehouse literally go from an empty space to now what it is, which is beautiful, right? And so well, I think a lot mm -hmm. of times our, our community folks just drive around spaces and don't, don't know really what, what, what services they yes. have. Another space we've had at, is at the Social Enterprise Greenhouse. Um, we've had it at AS220. Uh, Trinity Center, um, okay. and all these spaces are talking about the same issues that we're talking about, equity, right? And they're talking about how to connect with the community and how to how to um, uh, be more effective with with people and 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 share their resources. So, uh, different spaces has been something I think that people really like. Be oh, we had it at the the library at the State House recently as well. Very good. Mm -hmm. So, so you, I did hear you mention that you have an, a, a meetup coming up soon. Uh, when is that and where is that? We actually had our last meetup oh, you had a, for you the school had year. It. So okay. it was May. So the next one would be like the welcome to school type of oh, uh, in meetup in September. Okay. Yeah. Right. So the summertime where right now we're working where we have some interviews that will be taking, in place, taking place for a promotional video for Edu Leaders of Color, Rhode Island. Um, so that's taking place now. And during the summer, we're really gonna be building out these four seminars that are gonna be taking place uh, from September to December, the equity seminars. We also have an advisory committee of six people in that community that um, will be helping us uh, in the development of our strategic plan. Are these education professionals or? Yeah, we have, it's a combination. So we have teachers, um, we have, um, and we have teachers and other education, education leaders. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ron, I'm gonna give you a chance to, to, to chime in here. Yeah. Give me some oh. thoughts as to where you see um, edu 
edu leaders of color. Yeah. Uh, where, where do you see them in, in two to five years? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think the bigger vision is that we want to actually have a way and a comprehensive strategy where we're actually making progress on these goals that we're attaining. And for us, um, we know that, for instance, across the state, only 5%, less than 5% of teachers identify as teachers of color. Right. Uh, wouldn't it be amazing if we're actually able to make gains and see that double um, over the next five years, 10 years? Um, mm -hmm. That's the kind of goals that we're trying to set. So you feel that the influence of your organization should generate or uh, some some more hiring. Yeah, exactly. And retain. We, I, uh, yeah. And I mean, we want to get people interested in going into education who identify as being from underrepresented backgrounds. Because often, you know, I, I can even speak for myself. Growing up, being a teacher was almost like that is like you know, if all else fails, you can go become a teacher, right? It wasn't okay. like something that was seen as a highly lofty, a lofty sought after job. It was something that. Um, a lot of kids just kind of was like, I definitely don't want to be a teacher, but we're trying to make teaching as a profession where kids want to go into. The big idea down the road for me is that we start to think about, you know, some of my just personal goals is that we're able to create some sort of legislation around this particular goal. Everybody keeps talking about it, but I feel like we need an actual comprehensive strategy to approach it. How do we actually recruit and retain more educators from underrepresented backgrounds, mm -hmm. right? And what, le how can we use policy and legislation to influence that? Um, also thinking about how can we create actually recruitment um, in the sense of how do we attract more people in there? How do we leverage community resources such as programs such as Breakthrough Providence um, and after school programs to give kids opportunity to actually teach um, and, and learn what it's about, right? Mm -hmm. That to me, if two, five, two to five years, if we can create some sort of comprehensive strategy to, to bring all of those things together and also think about on a more policy legislative side to make that, those things happen is, is where, I, where I see us and, and, and down the road. Now, that, I mean, obviously, besides commitment, that it's going to take some dollars. Now, you, I, I did hear yeah. you say that you're, now that you're, you're funded, is it public funds or private funds that uh, are supporting you at this point? Currently, uh, all private, private. funding. Mm -hmm. um, okay. You know, what, what was great about the last meetup, so um, as part of the meetup, I also asked, essentially made a plea for donations for Breakthrough because okay. we're doing a lot of the great groundwork. And the response was amazing. And, you know, one of the things I think is interesting when you think about nonprofits, for instance, and, and just initiatives like this, you know, across the board, about 80% of funding for these type of, for nonprofit organizations, education nonprofit organizations, comes from individual donations, yes. right? So if we're able to leverage the strength of the community mm -hmm. so that we have people who are actually, um, donating into these different initiatives, I think not only does it show that it's a great initiative, but people actually are giving a vote of confidence with yeah. their dollars, right? Yeah. Um, and we're creating a grassroots movement that's not just necessarily funded by foundations and these bigger organizations, but it's funded by the people. And I think that is huge in terms of making change when you get a community, um, in our case, even the state, mm -hmm. um, invested into this issue via the way of financial resources or even time, right, okay. as a resource. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, guys, believe it or not, a half hour has gone on. We, oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's gone. We, we've run out of time. But that I was wanna, fast. I, I, it is. It's true. I want to thank today's guest, Carlin. Thank you. And, and Carlin. Thank you. Uh, and you, the viewers, for turning into uh, another segment of In Another Opinion. A special thanks to PBS for making this program possible. Yes. I'm your host, Peter Wells. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at In Another Opinion at gmail.com. And have a great day. Island Foundation, partnering with passionate Rhode Islanders to lead, transform, and inspire our state. Learn more at rhodeislandfoundation.org.